Hey everybody, welcome back. Thank you for joining me for another Royal News video. So this one's a slightly different start to the video because I'd like to talk about the last couple of days of special commemorative events in Canada, in the USA, in the UK, and of course on the beaches of Normandy. For today is the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landing, otherwise known as Operation Overlord, the largest amphibious invasion in the history of war with over 150,000 American, British, Canadian and allied troops stormed 50 miles of the Normandy beaches. On the 6th of June 1944, Allied air forces parachuted into drop zones and ground troops landed across five assault beaches which were called Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno and Sword. To fool the Germans, there was a series of fake operations set up, fake camps, plans, coded radio messages, and even on the very same day, they bombed Calais just to cause confusion. The French resistance cut telephone lines to stop the news of the invasion reaching the German high command. By the time they had found out the true extent of the invasion, it was too late. And by the end of the day, Allied forces had gained control of the beaches. It did not end the war but it was the critical turning point in which victory was eventually achieved. The bravery that these men showed I do not even know how to convey into words. So many lost their lives, so many before they had even touched soil. Veterans have been travelling from Canada, America, the UK to Normandy over the past few days some by plane, some by sea. And it's made me incredibly proud watching the public across many countries with their clapping and the cheering and showing so much love towards these incredible men and women, some which are the last of the greatest generation. Watching them return to Normandy and to the beaches and to the war graves has definitely been emotional for many. I don't just get upset myself because for those that lost their lives, which were in the thousands but mostly I get so emotional thinking of how terrified they all must have been. So many of them were still just young boys and the bravery that they all showed honestly it's it's truly incredible and over the last few days we've heard so many of these men tell their stories, sharing their memories their photographs, and it's been a real roller coaster. Some of laughter, some of tears, some of joy, and mostly of absolute inspiration of how incredible these men and women were and are. There have been fantastic tributes with aerial displays, special services held in Normandy, the UK, Canada, the USA, Australia. There have been reenactments on the beaches of Normandy, not just from the sea, but also from the skies, remembering all of those that some, as I said, many did not come home. On Wednesday the 5th of June, there was a very special event attended by the King and Queen and the Prince of Wales in Portsmouth. Camilla looked absolutely beautiful as she stood alongside King Charles as he gave a very special and poignant speech. But when they were sitting down in the crowds later on, listening to the veterans tell their stories, Queen Camilla, Lordy, she set me off again, as did the King, who fought back tears, listening to 98-year-old Royal Navy veteran Eric Bateman. We were with the American fleet on the way to Utah Beach, where there were ships as far as you could see. You could almost walk across the channel. I'm lucky to be here 80 years later with two of my great grandchildren. So many men and women, including my dear friend, Fred, who joined up with me, and but unfortunately never made it. But this is why these stories are so incredible. So many people only learn about wars through books. They only learn about them through films, which a lot of them, you know, it's not real life. These men and women are telling their stories and sharing their memories. These are the realities of what they experienced, what they went through. And these stories should always be told and never be forgotten. The Queen was seen later speaking to Mr Bateman later on. And honestly, I just can't think that there was a dry eye in the house. Now, the King's speech was wonderful, as was Prince Williams. Speaking of no dry eyes, there wasn't certainly a dry eye in this household. 
world because Prince William had read a diary extract and it was a soldier writing home to his wife and his two young children. Dear darling, you know, I, th I think he thought it was his last letter. Spoiler alert, it was not his last letter, but Prince William didn't do a spoiler alert. This is an extract from a letter by Captain Alistair Bannerman of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, addressed to his wife and written in his diary on the morning of D-Day. You, my angel, sleep gently in the nursery, I hope. Your thoughts have helped me so much. They have given me real strength. I can imagine how you listen to the news at nine o'clock and think of me with love. I do not believe that I can now write for very long. We can now see the French coast and very soon we will have to play our part. I must go now and look for the landing markings with my binoculars to ascertain our landing points. So, my darling, on we go. I know that you are with me. Au revoir, God bless, I love you. Captain Bannerman survived the landings and the war, being taken prisoner and returning home to his wife and sons in April the next year. Too many never returned when he said, right, darling, I must go now. We're, we're almost there. That I thought that it was, that was it. Gosh, look, I can't even tell you guys. Do you know, I get so annoyed with these narcissistic little twerps that are all across social media and you see them crying over the most ridiculous things. This is just something I cannot control. And I don't know how many people, I was speaking to a woman in the pet shop earlier about D-Day. We both stood there crying because the emotion, the absolute magnitude of what this day represents and the number of lives that are lost. I don't know many people that they can't find the emotion, especially listening to these veterans. This isn't a film. This isn't a book. This is their memories. This is what they lived through. And it is truly inspiring listening to them. But this is why they're called the greatest generation. The ones that did survive, the ones that lived, they lived their life. They got married. They had children. The horrors that they went through, the things that they saw, they still can continued and they helped rebuild our countries after such a devastating loss. This whole thing where people say about the Brits, the stiff upper lip, it wasn't just the Brits stiff upper lip, it was that generation across many countries because you just got on with it. The same as those boys that must have been terrified and men when the moment that they arrived on those beaches. It was a job, they knew what they all had to do and they did it. The last few days, whilst, as I said, it's made me cry a lot, it made me feel humbled and immense gratitude for all of the sacrifices that so many of them, that they made so we can have the freedoms that many of us still have today. There have been so many wonderful commemorative events put on over the last few days and the love and support that's been shown to our veterans, not just from the UK, but all of the other countries as well, has made me feel incredibly proud. And at the very end of the Portsmouth service, they had one of my favourite aerial displays. And I'm going to play you the clip because you've just got to listen to the noise. It's just beautiful. quite surprised at was we didn't get an appearance from Harry. Obviously he wasn't going to be seen with the royal family but that's not to say that Harry wouldn't do his own attention-seeking stunt. We saw that when he and Meghan took a fashion photographer to an LA cemetery and apparently even closed it down so the public could not have access to it. I think if Harry had tried to use US veterans again on a day like this I think it would have backfired on him big time. It is very sad, and I've said this many times before, I do believe that Harry did genuinely used to care about events like this. I do believe that he cared very much for the veterans, but we've seen such a shift 
in Harry, even when it comes to the Invictus Games. We briefly see him interacting with veterans when Meghan's not there. The moment she arrives, everything is just about Meghan. And this is sadly reflected not just across the veterans and the royal family, but across all areas of Harry's life. His friendship circle has, of course, been dramatically affected. It's not just a feud that he's had with his brother. He has betrayed and let down lifelong friends, school friends, people that have had his back since he was a child. And we are seeing this more reflected when big milestones for some of his friends and Harry is finding much like the Met Gala that his invite is lost in the post. A wedding is happening tomorrow and I couldn't be more excited. It's not a royal wedding, but it's very, very close. This is the society wedding of the year. It's going to be huge. The wedding is between Hugh Grosvenor, the seventh Duke of Westminster, and he is marrying the beautiful Olivia Henson at Chester Cathedral. I'm excited to see what the bride is wearing. I'm also excited to see Chester Cathedral. Honestly, I think that the hubby and I are going to have to book a weekend away to Chester. It looks absolutely stunning. As part of the city's preparations, there will be several road closures. But as a thank you to the city, the happy couple have paid for 100,000 flowers which have been planted in displays all over the city, not just for the wedding, but also for the summer. Honestly, Chester looks like such a beautiful place, but I thought that that was a really nice touch by the couple. It's something that everybody can enjoy, unless, of course, you have hay fever. Now, this wedding is going to be such a grand affair. It is the creme de la creme of high society. And, of course, the future heir to the throne, Prince William, will be there with his son, apparently, Prince George, and will be taking up the prominent role of Usher. I'm not sure what role Prince George's will be yet. Hugh Grosvenor actually grew up with Prince William. You can see here he is considerably younger. But the men have remained close, their families are close, and, in fact, Hugh Grosvenor was picked by Catherine and William to be one of Prince George's godparents. When Olivia marries her husband tomorrow, she will become the Duchess of Westminster and the Duke's mother, who currently holds the title, will become Her Grace Natalia Duchess of Westminster or Her Grace the Dowager Duchess of Westminster. I'm absolutely loving this. It's sounding all rather Downton Abbey meets Bridgerton. I'm really excited for this wedding. I cannot wait to see what the bride is wearing. I will be covering this wedding, despite it not actually being a royal wedding but it does count because we will have the future two heirs to the throne there. Now, speaking of people that are not invited, but they're doing their very best to make the wedding news all about them, we've got Harry and Meghan. When this wedding was announced over a year ago, stories were about then talking about, oh, what are they going to do? Which brother are they going to invite? Because the Duke of Westminster is also Prince Archie's godfather, of course. Harry has to have what William has, or more than likely, Meghan has to have what Catherine has. But back then it was said that the couple chose not to invite Harry because of the fallout with William and Catherine. You think after those stories had circulated a year ago, that would be the end of it. But no, with obviously headlines gaining in momentum as the big day was impending, Harry and Meghan's sources or sources close to the couple have gone to none other than, yes, you're right, People Magazine. They felt that they needed to get the attention back on them. People Magazine have now confirmed Harry was in fact invited, but Harry has now chosen not to come. There was an acknowledgement on both sides that it would be difficult for Harry to attend. It was reportedly an understanding between two friends and the Duke sends his love, support and admiration for the couple on their wedding day. Couldn't have done that like the old fashioned way, maybe sent them a card, an email, a telephone call, a text message. No, we've chosen to do that through People magazine. But of course, it's not Harry directly, it's their sources. Now, the article does go on to further explain because we would all be up at night not being able to sleep unless we truly understood why Harry is not going to be there at someone else's wedding. They said transatlantic travel to the UK is fraught for Harry due to security challenges. 
but he's fine to go to Jamaica. He's fine to fly all over Nigeria. But yes, the UK, the dangerous, awful place that is the UK, Harry couldn't possibly come to unless he had the army protecting him. My gut feeling is that these two were simply just not invited, mainly because of the drama, the circus that these two create. And of course, the attention-seeking stunts that Meghan pulls at other people's weddings. Why would a bride want Meghan at their wedding, especially a society one? She gatecrashed Tom Inskip and Lara's wedding in Jamaica. She argued with Harry and even rudely argued with some of the bride's friends that were trying to reason with the couple who were causing a scene. And someone had clearly invited the paparazzi to capture the moments of Meghan in deep conversation with her prize. Prize. Sorry, boyfriend. Wedding number two, Pippa and James Matthews' wedding. Pippa had made it clear that if you didn't have a ring, basically if you weren't engaged or married, she did not want people at the church. They were allowed to come to the evening reception. Meghan decided to call paparazzi to make sure they captured her outside of a gym. Now, this wouldn't seem like such a big deal other than the fact that everybody knew this was Harry's girlfriend. She'd already, and Harry, created so much drama because he announced to the world for that ridiculous statement, which has now been taken off the royal family website, about how Meghan is being targeted and harassed people were being sexist and racist towards her and nobody had a clue who he was even dating and some people even struggled to work out who she was even when her name was announced but she deliberately called paparazzi to try and get attention on Pippa's wedding day. Wedding number three, Harry's cousin Celia Woodhouse's wedding. Meghan rocked up in a ridiculous oversized dress, a dreadful mismatched fascinator and she looked like that she had been dragged through a hedge backwards. Now, you cannot tell me that Meghan doesn't know how to look beautiful when she wants to. This is another way to get everybody to look at you, to go there and look like a complete state. Wedding number four, Charlie von Straubanzi and Daisy Jenks. Meghan decided that she was going to flash her bra as she waved at the paparazzi that she no doubt called herself. Obviously, Meghan knew what she was doing. You can see the way she's like, oh, it was deliberate. Wedding number five, Princess Eugenie's wedding. Of course, Meghan decided, being just mere weeks pregnant, that she was going to announce her pregnancy at the princess's wedding to Jack Brooks Bank. She didn't just do it to family members privately. She deliberately attracted attention by making sure, even though she was weeks pregnant, she wore her coat like she was busting out of a six-month maternity dress. Meghan is an absolute menace to other women's weddings. At this point, I'm honestly shocked that she hasn't rocked up wearing a full bridal gown. This is exactly why Meghan wanted to walk up the aisle by herself. She wanted to make sure she had the attention on her, not the bridesmaids. It reminds me of Snow White when she was walking behind the Queen up the aisle and everybody's going, ooh, ah, oh, look. And then Charlie's Theron turns around and realises they're looking at Snow White and not at her. Meghan has got the same attitude and we saw the way that she glared at Princess Charlotte when she walked past. Yes, I do believe the rumours that she bullied that child. But that's not the only thing that Meghan did at her wedding to make sure that she was the only person that everybody was ooh and ah in at, or whoa, she looks like something out of Charles Dickens' novel. The fact that she kicked her mother out of the car before she got to the church. Yes, Doria was actually asked to remove herself to go into the church, not alongside her daughter, which would have been lovely, not to allow her mother walk beside her daughter, which would have been very modern day and feminist of Meghan. No, no, no. Mummy was not to get attention. She was packed off so she was sitting way down in the pews so Meghan could have her moment. The woman is a menace when the event is not about her. Of course the bride and groom probably thought, do you know what, I think, I think it's probably best that we do not invite them and allow the circus that would descend on their wedding. So Harry and Meghan, I believe, deliberately went to People magazine, or rather Meghan did, through friends, through sources, to get one more final attention grab about someone else's wedding, just to announce to everybody they decided that they weren't going to come because it's not safe. I hate to be the one to say this yet again, but literally nobody cares anymore. That ship has sailed. The couple exiled themselves. And it's not the only wedding that Harry wasn't invited to by one of his friends. Last year, Jack Mann married his beautiful bride, Isabella, and Harry also wasn't invited to that one then. Harry, through Meghan's help, has managed to destroy 
pretty much the majority of his friendships. So it wouldn't just be William that it would be awkward being at the wedding with him. I think half the wedding guests are quite happy to see the back of Harry and his attention-seeking wife. I do not blame the bride and groom for simply choosing the other brother. So guys, that's it for me on this video. I will be back with you very soon. Take care for now. Bye.